Hi everyone and welcome to today's Chrissy B Show. Now on this program today we explore a very sensitive issue that many, particularly the parents amongst us, don't like to think about. There are currently over 57,000 children identified as needing protection from abuse here in the UK. Yet still there is little to no adequate training for spotting the signs and behaviours and preventing abuse before it is too late which is precisely where my special guest tonight comes in. Now, we saw Marilyn on a show a few weeks ago when her charity Enough Abuse UK featured as our good cause of the week. We were so shocked by her story and amazed by the sheer amount of work she was doing to prevent child abuse that we just had to get her back onto the show to understand more about the issue. Today, we'll be hearing how her three sons were sexually abused by their headmaster, who was also Marilyn's boss, and the massive impact that had on her mental health when she found out. Then Marilyn will be giving us some key points from the training program that she delivers up and down the country. So whether you're a parent, teacher, sibling or friend, what Marilyn will be teaching us today is vital for keeping our younger generation safe and free from abuse. So we have a mini training program right here on the show. So how big a problem is child abuse? Well, as we heard earlier, over 57,000 children in the UK are identified as needing protection. One in 20 children have been sexually abused. To put that into perspective, that's at least one child per class here in the UK. One in three of those will not tell anybody about the abuse, just their little secret. That's one in 14. So work on two children per class will be physically abused, with disabled children over three times more likely to be abused than non-disabled children. But it doesn't stop at physical or sexual abuse. A quarter of all children have experienced something upsetting on a social networking site, whilst one in three have been victims of cyberbullying, and a quarter have come across racist or hate messages online. Well, as you can imagine, this is a topic that provokes a lot of debate, so we wanted to hear your thoughts. Honey says, sending prayers to every child that's going through child abuse. I wish I could raise you all and give you the love you deserve. Tara says, accidentally seeing child abuse on social media hurts my heart. So many poor babies who can't help themselves and don't understand. Patrick reminds us that as an educator, you are mandated by law to report all cases of child abuse to either the police or social services. Jenna says, our most valuable resource on this planet is children. Child Abuse Prevention Month is every month. Join the fight. Vanessa says, I will never ever understand child abuse or animal abuse. This world is so cruel. While Storiano believes teaching your kids to hate people because of political views is akin to child abuse. You're feeding their minds poison, much like toxic food. Well, we will be hearing some key points from Marilyn's educational program later on in the show. But first, I wanted to understand a little more about her own shocking story. Welcome back to the show, Marilyn. Thank you for having it's me. It's lovely to have you back on. So obviously, for the benefit of the viewers that didn't see Marilyn before, you did come on um, to talk about Enough Abuse UK, the things that you've been through, and you made such an impact on us, Marilyn, that we knew we had to have you on and give you like longer to speak, because you. You, your message is so, so important. Thank you. So let's start with your own personal story. What happened to your sons? Well, it didn't come to light until 2002, and if we go back to when they were young in the 90s, early mm. 2000, I was the teacher at the school, head of music, and the head teacher I had met, funnily enough, before my twins were even born. I only had the two-year-old boy, and I was pregnant with my daughter, and I met him in the pew behind me at church. Mm -hmm. And he just tapped me on the shoulder one day and said, oh, what a nice mum, what a lovely little boy. I'm the new headmaster here. Um, where was he gonna go to school? I said, I don't know, he's two years old. How would I know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a harrow. Yeah, yeah. um, so anyway, well, when the baby's born, come and see, and off we did. And he was lovely to my little lad. Little did I realize that he was so lovely that he'd actually already got him on his radar. I didn't realize that this man was actually a paedophile. From the moment I met him in church, I then befriended him, I went to work at the school, I became head of music and, and taught. And so it came as an enormous shock in 2002 when the police literally 
literally turned up on my door and I had been divorced, I'd remarried, moved down to another county and the police had got permission to actually come and see me. And mm -hmm. um, uh, we're going to come visit you today. We don't want your children to know we need your children back here. Uh, straight after school. So, what on earth's going on? Anyway, they arrived at midday and they left at nine o'clock at night. And there they told me that we believe your, all your boys have been sexually groomed and most likely abused. I beg your pardon. Okay. This is my best friend. Um, you know, well, <laughs> you know, your name flagged up as you were obviously working with him so much. You were his best friend. He was your best friend. Um, and I went, I don't understand. I've been on every safeguarding course. How come I missed? What are you talking about? Then I accused the police of abusing me because I, I couldn't have lived without this man. He, he, he was everything. I had no money. I had no home. He was right there by my side and they were going, well, of course, that's what they do. I said, what? Who does? That's what groomers do. And I went, what are you talking about? Oh, gosh. And they said, well, he schmoozed you. He romanced you. He didn't kiss you. No, no, I was pleased because I'd just come through this awful divorce and I was absolutely thrilled he was my best friend. I was proud to have a man who actually didn't want sex with me. Little did I realise he wanted sex with my boys. Um, anyway, I, I was told then you are now a police witness. Um, if he contacts you, and he will, you are to tell us. So okay, you've got to keep, so you to keep, I've got to pretend, and I had oh, to keep wow. communication going. If he wrote to me, I had to send it to the police. So that was the September 2002. And funnily enough, I'd just got back from Australia. My daughter had almost died on the barrier reef at 19 on her gap year. Oh, Brought her back and was facing this before she went to university. And then in the April, he was arrested and charged. And I thought, well, here we go. And he went to the uh, magistrate's court and he said he was guilty. What? If, uh, he, if, he'd deni uh, if he'd denied it, man, do you think you would have kind of doubted and made oh, thought? Oh, totally. I would, wow. uh, because I kept saying, and the police were saying to me, look, think about it. And I'm like, I, I can't. You're asking me to, to, to grasp, and I don't know what I'm grasping on. I don't, he was my best friend. I really loved him. He loved my family. He knew us for years. I don't get it. You're, you're, you're abusing me. I don't get mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so then they tried to explain what grooming was. And I thought, well, I don't understand it. I've been a teacher all these years. I don't understand it at mm. all. So then it went to the magistrate's court. It then went to the Crown Court. And he said uh, he was guilty again. And at the Crown Court, he walked away with a £200 fine. And <laughs> because the judge, I should never forget it. I wasn't allowed to go to the court because uh, the, I was then suicidal. And my mental health was really bad, as you can imagine. It wasn't course, the idea yeah. in the scheme of things that I would oh. give at my children um, to be abused by a paedophile. So I was in a pretty bad state. Mary, um, just a question. When did he actually do carry out this abuse? Uh, between the ages... Uh, well, of course, they take a long time, you see. He targeted my first son when he was two. He was always on the radar. So in, in, your, in your own home, was in it? In school. Or, oh, in the school. In, in the church first, and then he went to the, the Church of England yeah. primary school. Mm -hmm. And then... That abuse started around about 10 and 11. Then my daughter was born. Then my twin boys were born. Yeah. And then they were on his radar virtually from the moment they were born. Gosh. And it started when they were eight years old and it went on till they were about 12. And I, all I saw, what did I see? I didn't, there were like odd little moments. And that was now I realised the clue that, uh-uh, that's weird. Uh, oh, oh well, you know, it's just the way he is. And that's of course what they do, this exaggerated behaviour. And everybody was, what irritates me now is I look back and so many people said when it all came out in court, well, we always thought he was weird. Well, you know, he never really dated you. You know, if you thought for a moment that, you know, I was a woman on my own with four children had come through a horrible divorce, I was homeless. If you mm. really thought that this man was up to no good, why didn't you tell me? Well, why course, didn't you tell yeah, me? Yeah. Where was your duty of care to my mm -hmm. children? Do you know, none of those people do I now talk to. Only one friend said to me, she saw one of my boys, I'll keep names out of it, he mm. was 13 and a half, and this man, I then found my own house, the divorce had gone through, I bought my own property. And this friend of mine, who finally had been abused herself, saw okay. my, one of my sons go and sit on this man's lap, and I was at the sink. And she said to me after he'd gone, there's something wrong with that. I mean, what are you talking about? She said, don't like it. 
I don't like the smile he gave your son and the smile that your son gave mm -hmm. back. And I said, oh, he's always like that. Well, of course, that's part of the grooming process yeah. because for four years, that's how he'd always been. Very, very touchy-feely, mm -hmm. very generous, you know, and I, I just didn't get it. And because you, would, you probably would have felt guilty for thinking anything bad of him because he'd been so nice to Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah. and this is how it works. Yeah. You know, the gifts, the number of times he bought things. I was homeless, I had no money. My ex-husband did not pay me the maintenance. I literally okay. had my bank account blocked. I had yeah. no money with four children. So, you know, what are you going to do? This friend who's been your friend for many years, why was I going to doubt anything? Mm -hmm. Nobody had actually raised a flag. No one had said he was always known. Everybody at the school, all the mums adored him. All right, he'd never been married, but he had been engaged mm -hmm. and that hadn't gone ahead. And uh, there was nothing. Well, now, of course, it would be like the nose <laughs> on my face. Yeah. But then when he when he walked with a 200 pound fine and just on the sex offenders register well i can remember standing in my back garden and just screaming when the police rang and said he's back on the streets That's awful. i just could not believe it and i then wrote to everybody i could remember, i just wrote to every, i didn't know you have 28 days to appeal and people in mm. this country aren't told that and you don't need a lawyer to appeal so i now actually appeal for other people to mm. the attorney general and i wrote to everybody i was threatened with um uh oh what's it called um oh something of court what's it called that um I can't remember the name. Contempt. Contempt, contempt of court. Mm. I was threatened with contempt of court. I said, well, you know what? I've lost everything that my life ever represented. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lock me up, throw the key away. I don't care. But that man is going to jail. And I met who was then Lord Faulkner, mm -hmm. who was then the Lord Chancellor. I met uh, the Attorney General, who was Peter Goldsmith at the time. I said, I made my own case. I couldn't afford a lawyer. And I said, this has to be unduly lenient. He said he was guilty. He was head teacher of a Church of England school. He had a duty of care. How can he walk? Mm -mm. And then the papers came up and Goldsmith said, no, nope, it's unduly lenient. So off we went to the High Court of Appeal and I won. But to yes. see your best friend go to jail. But I felt that was sort of like righteous anger because I was also worried that I'd be seen as a Myra Henley. We've just had mm -hmm. Ian Bray. You know, I knew this man for so many years. How many parents would think I was procuring children? Mm -hmm. I felt I had to clear my yeah, name yeah, and for him to seek justice. And I asked permission of mm -hmm. my children. I could, we can disappear into oblivion or I can fight. But if we do, we all lose anonymity. You spend two days thinking what you want me to do. And immediately all the boys said, Mum, nail him. Go ahead. OK, good. Marilyn, how, just before we go to a break, we've got like about 30 seconds. But can you just tell us in a nutshell how you coped mentally? And because you said you mentioned you were suicidal, but how did you pull yourself out of that? Uh, it was a police officer at a dinner party okay. who uh, we were sat at this dinner party and he said he'd seen the stuff in the papers. And he said, I'd gone to the, the, the loo mm -hmm. and as I came out, it was a big house. And he came out and he said, um, so how are you? And I went, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. But I, I had already planned three days hence on the following Tuesday. I knew my husband would be out, the children would be out. I absolutely knew how I was going to kill myself. Mm -hmm. I had it all sewn up. That's why I felt relaxed because it meant absolute... To me, why would they want a mother that clearly had not protected them, had been obviously dysfunctional, I felt. So to me, I was better off leaving their life. Mm -hmm. And this guy said to me, he's not worth your spit. He's not worth what comes out of a dog's bottom. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? I know what you're going to do. I said, you don't know me. You know nothing about me. He said, I work in child protection. I know exactly what you're thinking of doing. And I'm going to tell your husband to keep an eye on you. And I ran out of that person's house and I ran back to my house. And I can still remember now. I sat on the pavement under a lamp, a street lamp, sobbing my heart out. And all I said was to myself, I only know how to die. God knows how I'm going to live. But I knew this man was watching me and I knew I had to pull back mm -hmm. and I just had to find the strength. But I've never lost my faith and that's okay. the one thing no one's ever been able to take away from me. Okay. So I hung on to that's that. What, okay. All right. Marilyn, we're mm -hmm. going to go to a quick break. Mm -hmm.
Thank you so much for sharing your story. I know Thank it's you. difficult to talk about yeah. these things, but now after the break, Marilyn's going to actually start a, a kind of mini training session. As I, as I was saying to Marilyn earlier, if we don't have time to cover lots of stuff on the show today, we will do more shows about this because I think it's something that's so, so important. So join us after this. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show everyone, where today we are focusing on preventing child abuse with Marilyn Hawes, founder of Enough Abuse UK. Marilyn, we're going to get into the, the training part yeah, of the, the show bit. now. <laughs> yes, okay, so, right. so um, let's talk about how observant we need to be first of all, Marilyn. Well the thing is, when I do my training I always say, okay, when you came into this room today, what did you pass? And I always look for something that's obvious, like a, a, a fire extinguisher or a big mirror. Okay. And the answer is very few people in the room. I go, what was the last thing you saw on the right hand side before you came into this hall today? Oh, I don't know. And I go, and I go, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And I go, that massive mirror. Mm. And I go, ah, oh, ah, oh, what mirror? Yeah. yeah. I go, so the thing is about how observant, the thing is about groomers. Mm -hmm. They wait a long time and they wait until you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So when you're like focusing on something like going to a, coming to a studio, trying to get to a wedding you, or anything, getting to mm -hmm. work, you're like Pfft. and out here in the bigger peripheral area, in the grey wings, in the shadows is where these slimy snakes move. Mm -hmm. And they're there hovering, waiting for that moment when you are so focused and they look for vulnerability. Now I go into prisons and I've spoken and I still do. I was in one three weeks ago because mm -hmm. I want to make sure that our training's on point, okay. that what are the latest trends? Are we still acting in the same way as we've done for the mm -hmm. last 20, 30 years? And they do operate to a blueprint offline. There is a blueprint okay. they absolutely follow. Um, and you know, that, that area in which they move, and it could be three, four years just waiting there. And they very say patient, to me, oh, they're very they? patient. Because wow. all that time they're grooming and it's the grooming they like because mm. the grooming is about control, about mind games. I get to say when, where, if, how, or maybe not. And they like that um, and they like that bit. So the anticipation of waiting, they're happy to wait. Okay, it's an so absolute <clears throat> game of deceit in a class. Sounds horrific. It's, it's really horrible. Like, it's really, really horrible. So then, what what can you do then if you? Well, we have a mantra. I, I know people are very distracted, especially with social media, and no, I just see people on tell. their phones all the time. So it's like it sounds like it would be a lot worse. Well, now. if people, no, well, if I could just say, if people were less, if they were more internet savvy and didn't use social media and protected their privacy more. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later on, but okay. you know, you are still more likely to be sexually abused by somebody you let came through your door. So 60% is within the family, 30% is someone like in my case, the friend, um, the head teacher, the tutor, the swimming mm -hmm. coach, whatever, the neighbour next door. Um, and then you've got the small minority, about 1% are the, the, the random people, but yeah. 60, 90% together yeah, that, we know. that person was trusted by your carer guardian parent now marilyn at what maybe age do abusers start to kind of around manifest? 10 10 about 10 years old so um they all say because i'm going to show you in a minute a bit of play-doh but if i could actually how able are you to prevent it that's one of our mantras mm. do you acknowledge that one in 20 children in this country are reporting having been sexually abused. We have 12 million children approximately, mm. do the maths. One in 20, this is an NSPCC figure, 80% isn't reported, so think. You know, 60% it's in the family. One in five children are reporting other forms of mm. serious abuse, so that can be physical, emotional, verbal, um, neglect, all those things create a problem. So are you acknowledging the reality? Do you believe it? Are you listening to the children and are you educating yourself and other people? When I say listening, I, and I digress from what your first question was, but it is important to say this. Mm -hmm. Children do not have the language skills to say whatever. They could be babies. 
You know, yeah. children yeah. are abused at four months old. They don't know. And of course, they're silenced. They're silenced with this toxic fear and shame. Um, and it's very difficult to say, but their behavior will tell you. And what mm. comes out of their mouth? This is a game for the offender, a game. What child doesn't want to play a game with another adult is going to have fun playing it off against its parents? Mm -hmm. A game. So these games involve very innocent things that are more sinister. So um, I can think of three or four case studies straight off the top of my head. Change of behavior from being a very, very perfect, lovely children, ordinary five-year-olds, very, very good, very, very happy children, and then it changes. Bedwetting, soiling their pants, okay. head banging, anger, um, grinding their teeth, just regressed and yet not just, wow, what's going on? So we've gone into these situations and said, well, what else was going on? They must have been saying something. What, what, so we know what's going on, but what are they? And then in all three of the four cases, three, one little boy had said, well, my cousin's coming round to play Thomas the Tank Engine with me. Hmm, hang on a minute. Thomas the Tank Engine, around about the time all this behaviour started, let's play the game. Well, the tunnel wasn't what we thought, neither was the engine. So then we progress from that, we sort that one out, and then we go on to parents and say, okay, so how do you stay safer? You sense it in your stomach, you truly do. You cannot put a value on that mm -hmm. gut instinct. Mm -hmm. This is your second brain. You go, oh, that's weird. It's already sending a message yeah, yeah. here. Beware. Animals, the bird and the cat, bird flies away, not us. We start trying to rationalize it. Oh. It can't be, it's the teacher, it can't be, it's the priest, it can't be, it's granny, it can't be. And so we stay in the problem. So you sense it, you have to become alert to what is this feeling. You have to focus on it. And above all, the call to action, you have to engage, for goodness sake, tell someone, and you record it. That doesn't mean necessarily tell the police straight away, yeah, yeah. unless you've seen a rape taking place, but just write it down. Mm -hmm. My statement for the police of these weird little second moments was 40 pages. 40 pages of missed moments. How stupid did I feel when I handed that over? You know, these like uh, moments that I missed and there was the picture. Oh my goodness, another broken family, another mm. dysfunctioning family, another fair haired boy. There it was, how stupid did I feel? But are they born, you're not born to abuse. I have here behind my back, okay. a ball of Play-Doh, right? <clears throat> no one is born to abuse. Now, if you wanted to prove that somebody was born like it, that means every single child would have to have an MRI scan. Now, true to say, if you were um, a heroin addict or an alcoholic, there would be some harm done. Mm -hmm. But what happens to trauma in a young child is, so say this person has had a lot of, in the early years, physical abuse, okay? Mm -hmm. And a lot of effing and blinding or neglect shot in a room, not being loved or looked after, right? And what happens is the cortisol, which is another chemical, it mm. spikes, and it eats away at the developing brain. It damages some of the neural pathways, okay? So then the whole of the brain is rejigged, reshaped, the neural pathways are broken, the coding of the brain is altered. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna be a functioning child, is it? So that child now starts play school or nursery or infant school and it's already damaged. Now, are we writing that off and saying, oh, have you seen the parents? Or are we going, hang on a minute, this is extremely exaggerated bad behaviour. You know, like the boy who killed the guinea pig mm -hmm. at six years yeah. old. Mm -hmm. Hello? We're not asking the right questions. Why? 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 Always with this, start being the child, ask why and you cannot put a value on your instinct. Now, if that is now sorted out and someone does all that questioning right and we can get it in the early years with early intervention, yeah. with the right trauma therapy, very quickly, that person can be rejigged. The coding of the brain is healed. The neural pathways redevelop. Bingo. But if someone isn't going to notice that because we're too busy, and I, as a former teacher, have a real problem with this. Yeah. If you're too busy to go the extra mile for a child, do us all a favour and leave education. 
There is no role for you yeah. in teaching. Mm -hmm. It is a vocation, and I'm passionate about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Go and work in a shop. No one has a gun at your head. You know, don't do this to people in education. These children have a small window. So this person comes in, this child comes in like this, and it's all been mishmashed. So no one's noticing it. Frontal lobe or part of the brain is harmed. So what's this experienced child have of love? Hmm. I love you. Mm -hmm. hmm. Shut up. Oh, I love you. This yeah. is now distorted. OK? This is distorted. This is distorted. But when I get to 10, which goes back to your fiddling yeah. point, yeah. all the testosterone is pumping gas. Quite normally, thank you very much. But nothing is in alignment. Right, OK. This doesn't know how to have a relationship. This has not grown past early childhood or childhood per mm. se. So its comfort zone is here. Therefore, this is feeling sex, but this hasn't grown. You can prevent this. You can prevent so much of this. And I am passionate we are not doing enough because that person is going to go on, end up in prison, mm -hmm. come out the same because the prison doors of many offender prisons are like the revolving doors in a hotel. Mm -hmm. Because the therapy inside prison is not dealing properly with personality disorders. I mean, your demonstration is very, very clear. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit basic. No, 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 it's not. But it's very clear. It's really, like, made me think, and I'm sure, but, you know, so much needs to be done, doesn't I it? I know. So much needs but to be done But it all starts yeah, with yeah. prevention yeah. and people noticing and taking accountability. After the break, Marilyn, you're actually going to be demonstrating some grooming for us. <laughs> My teddy. Uh, yeah, we're going to be using it. Well, Marilyn's going to be using a teddy bear to, to demonstrate some grooming. It is going to be disturbing. You know, I am warning everybody um, beforehand, but I also think it's very important for parents to make sure, and, you know, guardians, to make sure that you actually watch this next part of the show. Chrissy B and my show is all about improving your mental health and being happy. Join me every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 10pm on my channel Sky203. Visit ChrissyBshow.tv for more information and subscribe to our YouTube channel Chrissy B Show. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chrissy B Show and on our Facebook page The Chrissy B Show. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone, where today we are learning how to spot and stop child abuse with Marilyn Hawes, founder of Enough Abuse UK. So, Marilyn, um, <laughs> it's been so interesting, shocking, I have to say, but you have really been explaining things so, so well for us to understand. Introduce us to your friend here. Well, this is my friend Joe, and <laughs> he's... Um, Joe, he could be Joanna or Joseph, so he's unisex Joe. Um, okay. So it depends if the audience wants it to be a boy or a girl. And what I do is, what I'm going to do for you now, is he's going to be like a five-year-old. Okay. And I'm going to want to just show you what happens and the sort of behaviours. If you look at reports when uh, police come out of a court and you read it in the papers, hugely you will see lap-sitting, and wrestling games. I don't mean ordinary tickling, I mean mm -hmm. really rough wrestling. The idea of grooming is these people do this in plain sight. Why are they doing it? They're doing it to see if anybody doesn't like what they're doing. And oh. I will be, so you're my best friend now, uh -huh. and so is your husband, and then you'll have a load of friends. This is why it takes so long with the hands-off grooming, because I've got to make sure that all your family and other friends like me. I wouldn't be known to be touchy-feely and mm -hmm. very generous and always giving a lot of time to your child. Now, you might have four children, but it might only be one that I actually am attracted to. Okay. And I'll find all sorts of reasons why this is the one that needs my attention. And I could be saying to you, oh, you know, well, you know, honestly, uh, Chrissy, um, he's been telling me, Joe, that he's been quite lonely at school so you know I feel for him so I'm going to give him a bit of you know for some reason I don't know why but you know let's just deal with it you know and I'll be doing a lot of this I'll find an awful lot of need to sit up close and personal even if there's two or three other settees in the room if I said to you now how many times Chrissy do you have to say to somebody come and sit on my lap 
Come on, don't. So, no, you don't. Mm -mm. Whose needs are we being met? Because mm -hmm. I find with children, they just go, hi. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah. get off. When did you last shower? Especially, <laughs> you know, no. So that's the first sign. Come and sit on my lap. Come mm -hmm. and sit on my lap. Then it's how it does that child sit on your lap. Now, um, even if, so now I'm a man, I should have worn trousers, shouldn't I? <laughs> Even if a child did sit on my lap like that, mm -hmm. if I was a, a gentleman of healthy intent, instinctively I would sit the child like that okay. or like that. But this child now, I am keeping this child sat on my groin. Why? Because the idea of this stage of grooming is that my genitals are going to be touched every given moment, in front of you, displayed in plain sight. Now. What you don't know is you may be feeling uncomfortable with mm -hmm. this scenario and you may want Joe to you know, come and help you in the kitchen or something like that because something makes you feel odd. But this child's not going anywhere because I've now got my hand up behind his back. You can't see, I've already got my hand down his pants and I'm also drawing um, letters and numbers on his back and the little game, because this is a game, a little game that we're playing against mummy it's going to get him a fiver for every letter he gets right. So he's not going to come and help you with the washing up or clear up or act as hostess or host to mm. your family. Of course he's not. He's happy here because he's now can see these brand new trainees he's about to get next weekend with me when I take him shopping. So, and I'll be watching all around who doesn't like me as anybody. Now, if there's anybody that doesn't particularly like what I'm doing, I'll find time later on to say to you, what's the matter with Fred? Or what's the matter with Susan? Doesn't she like me? And I'm trying to find out what they're saying. Because, oh, the, so you know, sinister. I don't it? intend to go to jail. Yeah. OK. So that's the lap sitting. The tickling I can't do because I'll lose my mic. But this would involve a child lying down with me literally on top of it, rubbing everything right like this. Uh -huh. And the child is screaming, going the colour of this. And then I'll be on my back on the floor, rubbing this child all over me, and the child's absolutely hysterical. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about ordinary tickling. We all do that. I'm talking about absolute... You will know the difference. Is there's a sexual energy in it. You mm. think, what's going on? So much so that one of my boys actually saw this last summer, funnily enough, at a church garden fete, and he saw a little girl with this, a guy on top doing this. Mm -hmm. And he went over to the mother and he said, I don't know who that is. I think she's your child. You need to stop that because I'm telling you that's foreplay. Wow. And that's what this is. This is uh -huh. foreplay uh -huh. for when you get that child on its own. So, you know, then the child, so hang on, so here we go. I found now a time when I can now access Joe on my own. Something's happened, you're vulnerable, your mother's gone to intensive care or mm -hmm. whatever. Oh, suddenly, bang, here I am, out the wings. Take the car keys off you, take this. I tell you what, you sort mum out, you go off with your family, I'll look after Joe. What could possibly go wrong? Mm -hmm. Now I've got him on my own. Now it's going to change very rapidly. I'm going to try putting my arm around him and touching. If he withdraws, I'll wait, I'll try again. If he accepts the next time, it ramps up and my fantasy ramps up massively. Now, how do we keep them silent? Well, I assume you wouldn't tell me on this show the best sex you've ever had, and I'm certainly not going to tell you. No. But, you know, how does a child get past that? Bearing in mind, this child has had to be silenced. So now I'm touching this child in sort just to see what's going on. Just gently at first mm -hmm. and then a bit more. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, ah. And now the child's beginning to get confused. And then the whispers in the ear come. You're dirty. You won't be believed. Mummy will die. Mm -hmm. You don't want... Who's going to believe the granddad's done this? You haven't said no. It's your fault. You shouldn't be so handsome or pretty, mm -hmm. whatever it is, you know? No one's going to believe you. You'll lose your friends. <laughs> Only I love you like this. You're special. Hmm? You're, you won't say anything. Think of the problems you'll cause. You're six years old, be the child. Oh God.
your mother's going to die. Oh, so I've great. got chill just going off down yeah. my spine, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. your mother's going to die. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to tell. You're six, seven, eight, nine years old. Yeah, yeah. How is that going to pan out? They're not going to say anything. And the other thing about consent, this really gets me. What is consent? Consent is understanding the consequences of your decision. Now, if you go back to the Play-Doh brain, Mm -hmm. the brain is distorted in the abuser. It hasn't been dealt with. So the thinking is distorted. These people are not sick. They've got distorted thinking. Mm -hmm. In my distorted thinking, the very fact you didn't say no, that's consent to me. You didn't say no. My brain is distorted. I don't think in a healthy way. It actually means understanding the consequences of the decision. Mm-hmm. They can't, obviously a child can't consent to sex, but for me, you didn't say no. End of. So then what is abuse? Well, it's not just tripping over somebody. The definition of abuse is using power and control which I'm doing, I'm controlling Mm -hmm. this child now. I'm actually controlling you. I've taken the house keys off you. I've told Mm -hmm. you what I'm going to do. I'm now controlling the child and what it's going to do and what it's not going to say and how often you're going to come to my house. And one more thing you're going to do now. And I'm schmoozing everybody. I have now got, I'm like a puppeteer. I'm pulling everybody's strings and they love this, the control bit. Mm -hmm. But it's the misuse of power and control over the vulnerable right? Mm -hmm. Knowingly to cause harm or injury, and this is the next bit, for personal gain. I get off on this. And it's like an abscess that's festering. And that's why the the person who is abusing, if you're a physical abuser, it's the same. If you're a bully, you know, I say to schools, you know, the bully and the bullied have both got issues. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't just isolate the bully and put it in detention. What is wrong with the bully? Yeah, yeah. Something is wrong. And the child who's, you know, the, the victim, as in this case, they need to be made more resilient. We need to build resilience in these children mm. to be able to say, no, you know, but it creeps up on you. And this is what people so don't understand. It's so sinister. It's so, and then in retaliation to that, boys, um, it's come out quite a lot that boys particularly, and even men, um, the link to arson, Okay. You know, I had a, a mother the other day, a four-year-old, that was setting fire to the living room curtains. And when what's going on? Have you asked the right questions? Mm-hmm. Have you looked at other behaviours? Who's around your child? And sure enough, she found someone and, oh my God, there it was. You know, boys, and it's um, a cathartic thing. It's also uh, f- for, I, I don't know why, I mean, uh, my husband was abused as a child and he used to stick his mother's cushions on the fire. You know, one of the guys that used to work with us, he um, w- was pushed downstairs every night by his mother to cover the bruises that his father then would give him. Mm-hmm. And he was an arsonist. And he said, oh, yeah, I started off with waste paper bins and it got to buildings. And just the so all sheer, signs, yeah, all signs the sheer happen. thrill mm. of watching someone else's life be out of control. But also, it is not unusual for the child who's about to be abused to set fire to where they are about to be abused, to cause distraction. And of course, also to hopefully, mom, you know, if you get to 14, 15 years old, the anger, I want to harm the offender, but it's not unusual for the child to set light to maybe the settee or the room or the building where the abuse is about to happen Mm -hmm. in the hope it's going to stop. And then domestic abuse, where you've got domestic abuse somewhere in that equation, somewhere in that mix will be um, sexual abuse. So even if a child, say Joe here is in his cot listening to mum being hammered around every night, you know, somewhere it's likely that she's also being raped. You know, it's in the mix. It would most likely be in the so mix. So some, some of these things like parents will put, or, you know, guardians will put down to, oh, my child's just misbehaving and the child even gets told off because while you're speaking now, and I'm re- remembering my mother-in-law who was being abused at a very young age and I think when she reached her teens, this guy that was a family friend, a very close there family friend. And uh, one day she just lost it and she, I think she smashed a glass on, on mm. his head or something and she got into trouble. Mm. Mm. Why are, you, why are you, um, you know, doing this to uncle so-and-so? 
And no one, and no one sort of really looked into it. It was only years later when she was already in her 50s that she spoke mm. about what actually happened. Mm. But you see, I'm guilty of that. I never asked mm. why. That's why I say when I start my course, always ask why, yeah. always be the child. You know, would you really say, would you really say mm -hmm. if you thought your mummy was going to die? If you've been bullied, I was bullied at school. Yeah. I can still remember Hilary Webster <laughs> five years old. Even now, I remember <laughs> what she said. Yeah. So there you are. You're now 35 years old and you've had you're dirty, you won't be believed, mummy will die. It sits there. Do you yeah. know what? I still today still have nightmares about this man. I still wake up having nightmares about what he said and what he did, even at every sort of therapy. But mm. sometimes, I don't know, it's always in the same scenery. And I, I don't know where it comes from, but that shows how, how impacting his yeah. grooming was, how it, how it Deeply, it gets into your brain. Marilyn, we're going to keep you on for one more part. <laughs> okay. So, guys, don't go away because there's going to be much more for you after this break. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, everyone, where today we are helping to prevent child abuse with Marilyn Hawes of Enough Abuse UK. So before the break, we were um, shown some very chilling demonstrations of how grooming actually takes place. And if you've missed the beginning of this program, please do head over to our YouTube channel in a few days time, Chrissy B Show, and check out the beginning of the program there. So now, Marilyn, you're going to continue showing hmm. some demos for us. Uh, I just because some people might still not quite get that quirky feeling. So I'd like to shake your hand, if I may, in two yep. different ways and okay. see if the audience can. So let's do it. It should be right hands, but let's do it for the right. Okay. So first yeah. Really nice to meet you, Christy. Mm. Thank you so much. I really, truly do appreciate this. And thanks a lot. And I hope to see you another time as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody should be cool with that. Yeah. Now I'm going to do it again to hopefully get that you might not, you might like it. And this is how the mm. offender judges, okay? okay? So let's do it again. Okay. Oh, Chrissy, lovely to see you. Mm. So nice of you to have me on your show. Thank you so much. Um, maybe afterwards we could go for a drink or something. And you okay? Everything all right? Mm. I can tell the audience right now she hates it. Yes. <laughs> she absolutely hates it. Her yeah. eyelids, she doesn't know she did this because this is the non-verbal behaviours. Oh, tell me. And I am so, now I'm the new abuser. Uh -huh. I'm looking for vulnerability, okay? Mm -hmm. I know you hated it. Your hand shape was completely different. Mm -hmm. Your pupils went like really? that. Yeah, you, I could see them. Yeah. They went like that and, and you were like, I, you could just tell. I don't want to be here. This is really okay. horrible. I know you're not vulnerable because mm. all your body language, your handshake, everything, and I moved into your personal space, you were mm. like shifting back in your chair a bit. Your eyelash, and I am looking for vulnerability. Now, wow. if you have been in a situation where your, per, your, your relationship's falling apart, like mine was, and you're mm. sick of being sworn at and hit, you're gonna suck it up. Bingo, I've got you. Yeah. You're going to go, oh, lovely, someone who isn't swearing at me, someone who isn't throwing a brick at me. Wow. You see? Yeah. And that quirky feeling, that didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. But for the person that's loving it, thank you very much. You didn't like it. I'll try 10 more. There'll be someone that will. Okay. Wow. If you go into an offender prison, it's so quiet. The, their manners are impeccable a lot of the time. A lot of them are nice middle class people, white collar workers who had excellent education. And they're very good on their pride. Very good on their people soft skills. Wow. <laughs> You're doing it again. Your eyes. Because it's making me it's horrible. It's really Your like... eyes are shim. <laughs> but you can get in a close up on my eyes. eyes. <laughs> You really don't like it. It's like you're like, oh, my God. I know, I know, I know. But it's you know, what, what I want to do as well oh, is why is it so important that we, you can tell I was primary school, but why <laughs> is it so important that we get this right? Because I want to look, look, here are, <laughs> here are two people. I don't know what sort of day you've had and you don't know what sort of day I've had, but behind mm. the eyes, we don't really know what's going on. And that's why yeah. I say it's so important. This is the damage that's done that we don't see, the hidden damage. I hope I got the right matches here. So these are the ones, this is sort of, nothing is that simple and that perfect, but this is a child behind the scenes who's had a loving upbringing, good school, mm. lots of support, nothing that perfect, but nonetheless, it gets the point that 
you're going to be out and go and make some good choices and yeah. life if you want it that way is your choice and you've got your potential yeah mm. but this person yeah here look what's happened here this mm. is what's going on behind matches splintered matches already struck upside whoops daisy upside mm. down that's what's going on behind the eyes of someone who's been abused that isn't telling you somewhere behind there are still bits of the person who is healthy. Of course, you can have therapy. And therapy, the right therapy, it has to be trauma therapy, mm -hmm. not just a counsellor that says, tell me how it feels. You know, I had eight counsellors like that, tell me how it mm. feels. In the end, I did tell her how it felt, and I didn't go back. Okay. <laughs> but you need a therapist that's talking to the amygdala, this mm -hmm. part of the brain, that just deals with the now not the past. I could spend 10 years talking about my past and I had eight therapists that did that. Finally, I found somebody who got me to thrive. They said, okay, can't change the past. Can't change mm -hmm. it. But here's Chrissy now. What can I do with Chrissy to make Chrissy thrive? Let's deal with the now. Let's give mm -hmm. you empowerment to move forward. And in so doing, I can put these matches up the right way. Okay, some will still be broken, but you're in a better shape. You yeah, will be in a better... Yeah. I mean, I know there's still brokenness in here. Of course there is. Mm -hmm. And realistically, I have to say, it's there in my own sons. You can't be abused and it mm -hmm. not happen. That's realistic. But it is so important you get the right trauma therapy. And, you know, and we can help with that and, and, and you know, push people, people yeah. forward to the right people. Marilyn, people that don't actually look for this help, whether they're a parent that, you know, has had children that have been abused or even someone that has been abused and they sort of live, you know, years without dealing mm. with that because they think oh, it's too late now. What's the point? It happened a long time ago. I've kind of moved on with my life. It's like they don't want to bring everything out into the open and like they just want to keep it there hidden. But it's, it's, it doesn't work, does it? Because at the end of the day, it's affecting your life in so mm, many ways. Exactly. Sometimes even things that you're not even realising that it is affecting. Exactly. But it exactly. is. It's a block. It just yeah. creates a block. And I just, there's a, di I cannot stand the word survivor. I think it's mm. so patronising. I wouldn't dare, although my children have done really, really well and they look to me like they're fine. I don't know what's going on behind the yeah. eyes. Yeah. You know, I don't know when their sons get to nine, ten years old, is it going to suddenly hit them? I hope not, but I don't know. They've got marvellous careers, lovely wives, and, you know, they've done well. But, of course, it came out when they were young, and I believed yeah, yeah. them. You cannot believe the number of mothers that won't believe their child. And that's even more abuse. It's just, you know, you, and, you know children under seven, and I wish the police would accept this, cannot make up the graphic stories. Their brains have not developed enough. Mm. Children under seven cannot make it up. To me, that should be evidence. And some yeah, of the yeah. stories I hear, you can't, they've either seen it on child porn or something like that, or they've experienced it. They cannot make it up. Mm -hmm. And you sit in the family courts and you hear people say, oh, false memory. You know what? <laughs> you, you say to me, my children's thing was false memory. You'll be lucky if you'll stay alive. Child sexual abuse, what I've done with Joe, is horrific. Sexual exploitation is in another league altogether. It is on street grooming. And you are talking about 12, 13, 11 year olds. The person at the top who is going to be the exploiter, the abuser, mm -hmm. is most likely three times older than the child. So if I have been targeted and brought into a room where there can be 20, 30, 40 men who are all going to rape me tonight. Oh God. And I'm 12 mm. years old. That person is likely to be nearly 40 years old, as will that person's friends be. Mm -hmm. So what happens, they filter down from the top of the pyramid. So at the tops, the person who's nearly 40, say, yeah? And now they have drugged, frightened, got people locked into them out of fear, who now be maybe 18 years old or 21, okay. and it scales down. So the 12-year-old will probably be targeted maybe by a 14-year-old who is accepting bribes and is already now, you know, mm -hmm. in the loop of fear um, and is actually exploiting themselves and almost uh, acting almost like a pimp. And those children are literally bounced around like a ball from man to man to man to man. 20, 30, 40 people in a night 
it's trafficking. And I think people mm -hmm. think that trafficking is coming into Heathrow uh, from Asia, your passport's taken away from you, you're put into the sex trade or you're put into nail bars or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's trafficking. But it's also to say, you know what, I'll pick a child up from Camden and I'll take them to Islington. Mm -hmm. So I will take them to a party where there'll be lots of drink and drugs and the grooming will have taken place before. Oh, you know, you're going to owe me all the drinks, all the chocolates. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. The presents. You're 12 years old and somebody buys you a gold necklace. Way. Somebody buys you a lovely mobile phone. I'm going to pay the bill. What that child doesn't realise is there's a tracker in it. And I can see every conversation you're doing. I will know exactly where you're going. And that child won't even know. And it's trapped. And this mm. is why suicides are going up. Mm. Those children are beaten senseless. They're, they're, just, they're just existing. And they're children. And you know what? <laughs> Everybody has got to take accountability. Mm. The, the ages has got to go now where people have got their head in the sand. You are accountable. Tomorrow it could be you. Mm -hmm. it, could, it could already be you. Mm -hmm. And you don't know it. It could already be you. You know, I did not know that my sister had been abused by my uncle. I did not know it until she was 55 years old. And she showed all the signs of trying to take her own life, self-harming. Do you know there's children in this country now as young as six years old that are self-harming? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And no one's asking why. Oh dear, they're self-harming. I wonder what that could be. Oh dear, come from a poor background. You don't self-harm no, unless no. you've got something significant. Mm -hmm. You don't go out getting blind drunk and hooked on drugs when you're 12 years old unless there's a reason. You don't run away from home. You know, why does that child not want to go home from school? Why? Why is that child always late? Why is that child always daydreaming? There's another clue. Is that child bored? You should never be a teacher. Or, mm. or is it dissociating? You know. I want your homework in by Monday morning. You know, hang on, miss. I've got to learn to survive by Monday morning. Suck on it. Yeah. And then Monday morning comes, do you go, where's your homework? Or do you go, hang on a minute, that's the third week now. Are we no, asking the question? Yes. Marion, I'm sure there's people watching now that are identifying, even if it's one small thing of, out of everything Absolutely. that you've spoken about today, please don't ignore it. Yeah, of course. Please don't ignore it. Email me, yeah. please email me. We yeah. get no funding for doing yeah. this, I have to say. If anybody mm. feels like donating. Time for change. Time for change. Marilyn, we have to leave it Thank there. Thank you but so much. As I said, you know, we will do more on this no, definitely. I you. really want to give you this platform to, you. to share your message and help other Thank people you. out there. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you okay? so much. Thank you. All right, guys. So, you know, if you do want more information about Marilyn's um, organisation, the details are on your screen now if you need any help. And if anything has affected you, then please do get in touch with us. Well, we have reached the end of today's programme. And until next time, bye-bye for now.